Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Mike, and in this video, I'll be showing you step-by-step -step how to make a blog. This is something that I've done many times with many different tools out there, but in this video, I'm gonna show you one of the best ways to do this, one of the most popular ways, and also a very affordable way as well. So with that being said, there's really several steps you wanna take when you're making a blog. I have them written down right here. The first thing you wanna do is choose where you're going to make your blog, what you're going to host it with, what platform you're going to use. And so I'll t explain what we're doing in this video in just a second. But the second one is to choose a niche. The third one is to choose a domain, a name, and a logo. We'll be talking about that as well. Fourth one is to actually build out your website, which honestly is not as hard as most people think. So I'll show you step-by-step step where all the tools are, how to do everything, how to make your website look really good with relatively little effort and with a lot of free tools out there as well. After that, you need to find relevant topics to make your blogs about. Then you just have to write your blogs, optimize them, and iterate as you start to grow your blog. So there's a lot to talk about in this video, but really it comes down to those simple steps. So getting back to the first step of choosing a host, choosing a platform really, some people opt for the simpler platforms such as Wix or Squarespace, and those website builders are great for making simple websites. Uh, maybe if you are like a small, like a dentist shop or any kind of small business, or if you're just looking for some really low level blogs, that's all great. But if you're looking to do a legitimate blog and that's the main purpose of your website, you're better off opting for WordPress, which is what most of the internet actually already uses. When you're looking at any kind of blog out there, odds are it's being run on WordPress. So WordPress is essentially the platform that is your, your CMS, your content management system. And you can think of this, I, I love this analogy here, think of it like Microsoft Word. So if WordPress is Microsoft Word, that's essentially how you're writing your document, how you're making it, but you then have to save it. You can't just close out of it or else it goes away into cyberspace. So if you wanna save it, you have to save it onto a server. So your host here is going to be, in this video, we're gonna be using Hostinger. Hostinger is one of the best ways to host your website. They're very fast, they're very reliable. We've used them on countless different websites and they have some really good pricing plans that are more than just competitive. But don't be intimidated, even though we're not using Wix and Squarespace, the interface is going to be very, very similar to those because we'll have something called Elementor, uh, which is a free plugin, or you can upgrade if you want. But even just the free version, allows you to have a drag and drop editor, which is incredibly easy to make your website. You can customize it any way you want. You have a lot of powerful tools in there as well. And you don't need to understand any kind of coding. You don't need to know anything about website design. You can just learn in this video and have more than enough tools at the end of this video to make your own custom website. So with that being said, let's get over to my laptop. The first thing we wanna do is go to santrellmedia.com slash hostinger. Uh, that's H-O-S-T. I-N-G-E-R, Hostinger. There's also a link in the top of the description. Click on that link, that'll bring us all to the same starting point. So that should bring us to this page right here. Don't worry if the pictures look a little bit different, that changes from time to time, but on the top you should see something that says hosting. So right off the bat, a Hostinger does host a lot of different softwares out there, so WordPress and some other ones as well. We want to just work with WordPress. So if we click on hosting, we can go down to WordPress hosting. It's optimized for WordPress, and now we can click on start now. That'll bring us down to several different plans here, and it can look confusing. Don't worry, I'll walk you through it. Uh, you have four different options, and of course the, the first one is the most affordable. The last one is going to be for when you're a much larger website. These prices are also based on paying for more than just a month at a time, and, and I'll mention exactly what that means in a second. But of, of all of these, I would say that most popular one, the WordPress starter, is probably the one that makes the most sense for you to do. So if we scroll down, you'll see that you do have more storage with this. You are able to have more monthly visits with this. It does come with a free email. So when you're reaching out to affiliates, you can be mike at santrellmedia.com. Well, you can't, but I am that right now. Uh, we can also get a free domain with this. You have unlimited bandwidth and other things like that. These are all going to be very, very important, but if you're really on a tight budget, the single WordPress website can still get you started. Uh, so you can definitely don't feel bad doing that. But like I said, I recommend going with this one. It's only $3 a month. We are going to select that. Hey, so sorry to interrupt the video, but there's two quick things I wanted to mention. One, Hostinger actually has a Black Friday sale going on where the WordPress starter pack is now $1.99 a month. So a little bit cheaper if you're getting it right now. And on top of that, if you wanna save another 10%, we have a code Santrell10, so Santrell and then the number 10, it'll save you another 10% on your purchase. I should have mentioned them in the video, I don't know why I didn't, but there you go, you could save some extra money by doing that. 
and that'll bring us to ask us essentially how long we want to have this. And as I mentioned, if you're paying for four years, you're getting a pretty substantial discount from $12.49 a month down to just $3 a month. So I always do at least 24 months, if not 48 months. So right now there is actually a promotion going on that you can get $2.99 per month for uh, 12, 24, or 48 months. Sometimes that's only for 48. But like I said, I usually recommend going with 48 anyway. And as you can see here, you don't actually get the free domain for the first year unless you go with at least 12 months. Uh, they don't want to give you a free domain for a whole year when you only pay for one month of the website. So let's go with 48 months for now. We're going to go down and create our WordPress account. So I'm just going to type in my email, my credit card information, and submit the secure payment. Now that we've done that, we can just click on Start Now. It's going to walk us through some of the basics of setting up this website. We can skip this if we want. It's just going to kind of make it easier for you in the future. But like I said, it doesn't really matter that much. So I'm going to say I'm creating this for myself. I'm building it myself. Uh, this is going to be a blog, and I know what I'm doing. This tutorial should hopefully tell you what you need to know. So now we're going to create our WordPress account. This is different from our hosting our account. Remember, WordPress is like a Microsoft Word. It's a software on which the website is being built. Hostinger is where the website is being hosted. It's kind of easy to remember those with that analogy there. And that's essentially like where the website's being saved. It's being saved on a server. So when somebody logs on to see your website, they can go, Hostinger has their servers online, and they can view your website. So WordPress is going to be a, a different account. We're going to make that right now. Uh, we don't need to add WooCommerce. Don't select that. And we're going to say continue. Do not forget this password. You need this to log into your WordPress account. And I'm going to go down here and instead of choosing a theme or template, they like to show you templates. We're going to choose one later on. I'm going to show you how to get one that is really, really relevant and also gives you a full template that's super easy to use. So I'm going to say skip. I don't need one of these templates. Claim a free domain. This is free with what we purchased, so we might as well do this right now anyway. I'm going to select that. And let's just say the name of my blog is going to be Santrell Urban, Urban Gardening. Central urban, urban gardening .com, uh, .com. That's going to be a lot better. It says it renews at $13.99 a year. That's fine. That's not really the best domain. You want something a little bit easier to remember, but for the purposes of this tutorial, this is just a demonstrative website. So it is available. We're going to say continue. If it's ever not available, you can always go to Google Domains. Uh, and it'll, it's really a great tool to help you find some other domains that are similar uh, and might be more available. So we're going to click on Finish Setup. You want to make sure the server location is at least close to wherever your target demographic is so they have the fastest load speed. So if you're writing and you're using a VPN or if you're in another country and you're not where you're actually going to have your audience, like if you're talking about Texas real estate and you're blogging from like, you know, somewhere else in Europe, you're going to want to make sure that you have the servers close enough to Texas so that makes sense for you. Now, the primary details, choose a country. I'm in the United States. Uh, United States of America, personal, say next step. So now I'm just going to enter my contact information. Now the domain is being registered to me. Uh, it should only take a minute for this to actually set up. They're adding the finishing touches right now. Now your next step is to choose a niche. Now in this video, of course, I am making about urban gardening, but you kind of have a Venn diagram with four circles. So a, a complicated Venn diagram, but the four quadrants that you want to look for are what you are good at on one hand, obviously something that you know a lot about or think you could learn a lot about. So don't make a blog about math if you are absolutely terrible at math. I think that goes without saying. The second one is what you like doing, what you're interested in. And even if you're not like an expert in it yet, it could be something that you are super passionate about and you are much more knowledgeable than most people out there because many searches on the internet are just for low level stuff anyway. And you can become an expert over time and start making more and more detailed blog articles. The third one is going to be what people are interested in. So what has a lot of search traffic? And it doesn't have to be massive, massive search traffic because the internet really allows you to reach some very uh, large audiences with very niche topics. And keep in mind, you really only need a couple thousand people maybe that would be very interested in this to make a full-time living off of that. This was really illustrated in A Thousand True Fans, if you've ever read that. Essentially, you don't need nearly as many people as you might think to essentially make a living off of something. So for example, if you are very interested in urban gardening or investing in farmland or anything that's a little bit more niche that if you go in public and talk to a random person, odds are that's not going to be their first thing that they search every day. 
But you can still, there's still plenty of big blogs out there that focus on that because there is still an audience. And then the fourth quadrant here is what can actually make money. Now, pretty much any blog out there can be monetized, but some of them are going to be better than others. So for example, if you are uh, really care a lot about sleep, that would be a great one because there are a lot of mattress companies out there, or at least there were several years ago, that paid a really high commission. So it is always worth, before you go into these blogs, just kind of Googling around and looking up what commissions are out there, for whether that is advertising or affiliate rates or anything like that, if there's software or your own product that you can sell, ways to monetize should be something you think about early on in your blog. As far as choosing a name, this kind of ties into what domains are available. Uh, you want to keep it memorable. You want to be easy to spell. You want to be something that uh, is not like super long, so keep it kind of concise. And then of course you want to make a logo that is memorable and also easy to see in a very small location. So I don't like logos that have a lot of small cursive font. I don't like logos that have a lot of detail in them. The simpler, the better. Look at all the big brands out there. Their logos are incredibly simple and a lot of them are even monochromatic these days. So with that being said, one of the best tools that we like to use is actually a free tool. This is called Canva. So if you go over to Canva or centralmedia.com slash Canva, you can sign up for Canva for free or you can up to pro. Uh, there are, you know, a couple differences and I did make a full tutorial in the past about how to use Canva and that's a great way to not only make your logo, like you might say, why do I have to sign up for something just to make a logo? Well, the truth is it's actually really good for a lot of other graphics throughout your website, throughout your social media platforms, maybe email campaigns. I use Canva all the time for a lot of different things and it's always just a good tool to have in your back pocket. So now that we get to this point, there's two things that we want to do before we actually edit the website. So if we click on manage site, the first thing is we need to have daily backups. So if we scroll down here, you should see, first of all, if there's errors on here about not pointing to your domain, that's totally fine. It takes a little bit of time until the domain, you can see right on the top, domain status, waiting for activation. So make sure that you go into your email and you actually verify that if they send you a verification link. And then second of all, it's just gonna take some time until it actually points to that. So from here, like I said, two things we need to do. One of them, we need to set up SSL, which should kind of automatically do that, but we're gonna wanna make sure that it actually does that correctly. And second of all, so there's SSL right there. Second of all, we want to set up daily backups. So if we click on backups, you never know when something is going to go wrong with your website, especially as a novice, you can break your website. And rather than trying to rebuild your website or trying really hard to recover it from something else, a daily backup is just such an easy checkpoint that you know, you're making your website and then you save it the next day, you break your website, you can just roll it back to the day before and everything is exactly the way it was. So I've used that so many times when I was getting started with WordPress, so convenient and I kind of still turn it on anyway, just out of habit because you never know when you know, some update's gonna fail and your website breaks anyway. So we can add daily backups for $2.09 per month. Like I said, it's totally worth it in my book for four years or you can actually even do shorter times as well. It doesn't really matter. It's always uh, charging the same amount. So I'm going to complete the payment on that one. And now we have daily backups. Like I said, so convenient. But let's go back and actually enable SSL. That is going to be the little lock icon you see on the top. And that's essentially, uh, whenever somebody goes to your website, especially if you're selling anything, you really require it for that. But that's saying that everything's encrypted, which is kind of a basic standard practice these days for a safe uh, website in general. And so when people don't see that, essentially your browser is going to make a big deal out of that. If somebody goes to your website and instead of seeing the lock, like most people don't look for the lock, but what browsers do is it says not secure really big and that scares people. That makes them think that you're gonna download some kind of virus on their computer. People don't understand what that means and so having SSL, so important, it's best practice anyway, so we need to enable that. So if we go back to hosting where we were, we can close out of that, we can manage our website and as we go down, we should see to SSL. So if we go down to SSL, it might say that it failed if it didn't actually finish this activation yet. There we go, it's failed. But eventually, once the activation, it takes a little bit of time, sometimes a couple hours, and then it'll actually say uh, successful. We should be fine with that. So if we type in our domain, centralurbangardening.com slash WP dash admin, so it's WordPress admin, easy way to remember that, click on enter, and this will take us to a WordPress login page. So now I'm gonna sign in, I'm gonna say remember me, so we're gonna log in right now. All right, so here we are on the WordPress dashboard. Now, there's a lot going on here, but I promise I'll walk you through everything on the left side and, and how to actually clean this up, because one of the first things I like to do is to get rid of a lot of the junk that it gives us right off the bat. So the way we do that is we start off with the posts on the left side, 
click on posts, they give us one little blog article. We're going to select that, go to bulk actions, move to trash, click on apply, and then I'll get rid of that. Now the same thing, we go down to pages, gives us a couple pages here, we can select them, go to bulk actions, move them to trash, apply, there we go, we got rid of that. Now, we still have a lot of plugins on the left side, and essentially, with WordPress, a plugin is like a, like an app on there, right? So if, if WordPress is iOS, then these are apps on there. So we can go down to plugins, and we don't need a lot of these. Like, they're great, they're powerful, right? But you don't wanna have too many plugins, because first of all, that's more, more to update, more to keep up with. Second of all, that's more surface area for attack or for just things to go wrong in general for your website. And so we can get these back as we need them. What I like to do is go through them, select the ones we don't need. I'm just gonna select all of them except for uh, analytics by uh, WordPress Monster Insights. Like I like that one, Google Analytics is good, but let's get rid of all the other ones. Oh, and we're gonna keep hosting her as well. So get rid of all these other ones, select all of them. We'll go to the top. First, we're going to deactivate these, say apply. It's gonna deactivate them. And then if we go to inactive, there were two that were already inactive, that's why I'm doing it like this. We can select all of them, click on bulk actions and go to delete, click on apply, and that will get rid of all seven of those. And now you'll see on the left side, it gets so much cleaner. Look at that, we don't have anything cluttering up the left side now. Just on the top, the first four are essentially how you interact with people visiting your website through posts, blog posts, uh, media, through pages like cornerstone pages and comments. Then here's how you kind of customize the look of your website. And then these bottom three here are really more about uh, the back end stuff. That's gonna be a one-time thing. So if we go to settings, we can touch on that right now. Starting off with the site title, I'm gonna leave it as Santrell Urban Gardening. Sometimes the default is just like whatever.com. So make sure it looks a little nicer. And then our tagline, we don't want it to say that. So we could say, uh, learn how to homestead Let's just say um, growing uh, vegetables. I don't know, say something like that. Uh, we'll get rid of the punctuation there. And then down here, right now it's still HTTP. I'm not gonna change that yet because sometimes Hostinger does take a little bit of time until the SSL is actually uh, set up with that. So sometimes it takes you know a couple hours until that's set up on the back end. So we're gonna continue editing our website, but maybe in a day or two days, Go back to here, or maybe even later today, you can go back and you wanna make sure that SSL is set up. So if we go to hosting, we can go to manage uh, the domain right there. And if we go down, you'll see SSL down here. Um, so SSL, if you click on that, that'll tell you right now, I think it's still failed because it's not actually pointing where it should. If we click on install SSL, it either works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't right now, um, then come back later and do that, right? But sometimes when you first set it up, it doesn't work. So that's why I recommend don't mess with that yet, but eventually you can force SSL on here. Down here, we have the date, the time. I'm gonna save changes, that all looks good to me. If we get on to writing, not a whole lot I wanna change here. Uh, reading, there's nothing there. Discussion's fine, media's fine. Permalinks, you do wanna change this. You wanna make sure that uh, you have, I usually use post name, I think that just looks the best. Instead of having some kind of date or, or having the day, name, whatever, numeric, I don't do that with my blog posts. I think that it's easier for Google to understand as well as for the reader to understand as well as for me to understand. When you go to a link, it's uh, centralurbangardening.com slash how to grow in March or whatever. I don't know, Wh whatever it might be. The name of the blog post just makes the most sense to me. Uh, going down here, we can say save, save those changes. And that's really all the settings I wanted to point out. So now we can start talking about how to actually design this website. As I mentioned before, there are some tools to make it incredibly easy. So we're gonna start off with a theme, then we're gonna get a template that has a builder associated with it. And then we can go and simply drag and drop and we'll already have a big template there. So there's not gonna be much we actually have to do. So let's go up here to appearance uh, and we'll see themes. So we can click on themes. And from these themes, there are three that are already there. We're not gonna use them. We're gonna go to add new, and we're gonna look for Astra. Astra is a really popular one. We can go and install that. And like I said, Astra is one of the most popular ones on WordPress, which is one of the most popular website building uh, softwares on the internet in general. So this is you're in good company if you're using this, which means it's robust and it works really well with a lot of other things. So now we have to actually activate that. It's not enough to just install things with WordPress and we're ready to go with this. Now, from here you can see that on the top, you should see this little banner that says, did you know Astra comes with dozens of ready to use starter templates? You can either click on that right now, or on the left side, we can actually go over to Astra, Astra options, 
And we should see over here, install importer plugin. Um, so we will actually be able to do that. We can click on install importer plugin uh, and that'll activate that as well. And that'll get us started with what the next steps actually are. So we can say build your website now. They're going to ask us if we want to use one of these three. Elementor is the right answer for this video. And now we can choose from a lot of different ones. So we have a lot of different templates. Some of them are paid. You can see premium ones right there. But there's an abundant abundancy of free ones as well. So we can actually sort them if you want from uh, all or premium. Uh, I think they used to have free on there as well. Whatever, we can't sort them the way I was thinking we would. But let's go through these and search for a starter template that makes sense for us. We are a blog and I want to be like a, a food blog maybe, travel. It's more like a garden blog. So what if we just say garden blog? Let's see what we have for that one, see if anything pops up. So we have a couple that kind of make sense. This one's a business magazine. Nothing, nothing that's really, really similar like I was hoping for. But instead we can just go up here, let's say blog, and let's just say we are a travel blogger. That's gonna be similar enough. We can show a lot of larger photos on that style. So we'll go to travel blog, see what we find. Uh, that's not what I want for this. Uh, maybe something along the lines of, this one's kind of popping out at me right here. So maybe we'll go to this one, we'll click on this, and it's gonna show you a little bit of what it looks like. Um, wow, I don't know why they chose that, uh, the parallax effect, but whatever. It, it's kind of cool, I guess. I, I'm gonna get rid of that guy down there. Um, and of course, the other thing to keep in mind is you can change anything on here. The text, the literally anything you wanna change. This is just a starting point, so you wanna look at something that has a generally similar layout to what you want. And so for me, I don't want this one. Let's find another one. This one looks good. I think this one actually looks pretty good. This will work for uh, a little gardening blog. We can show some pictures of a garden and things like that. So we're gonna go with this one. Now we can upload our file here for our logo. Um, if we don't have a logo, we can do that later, which I currently do not have a logo for this, so we will do that later. So we're gonna say skip and continue. We can choose our color scheme. This is gardening, so we want a lot of green-based stuff. Uh, we can choose a font that I think would make the most sense for us. And of these, eh, I kinda like that one there actually. So we'll say continue, and then we can tell the, they wanna know a little bit about us and what plugins we actually want. So leave all of these down here selected, that makes sense. Um, I don't want the newsletters though, so I'm gonna get rid of that one and type in my information right now. Now it's gonna take a couple minutes to actually go and build the website, but you'll see at the end of this, we'll be able to go to santrellurbangardening.com or whatever your domain is, and you'll see a full-blown website ready to go, and all we need to do would be to change some of the text and the images to our own stuff. All right, now we can go and view our website. We'll click on that. All right, so like I said, there is our website. It's it's really, there's not, like we just have to change the, the pictures and what the words actually say, but in general, it, it's really a, a step in the right direction here. So from here, we can go and we can start editing this website. So if we go back to WordPress by clicking on the little WordPress icon there, we can go and choose an individual page. So if we go to pages, uh, I will start off with the homes, the home page. Now we have a lot of other uh, pages that we don't necessarily need right now. We can change what they say later or we can delete them. You already know how to do that. Let's go to home and go to edit with Elementor. Don't click regular edit. If you do, it's gonna have you do some, well, you're gonna edit a little differently and I'll show you that in a minute, but Elementor is how we wanna really edit this. Now, the way Elementor works is with a section layout. So you can see a section is outlined in light blue. It's kind of hard to see right here. Let's go down and see uh, this section here. We can see this section outlined in blue starts up here, goes all the way down to here, and everything in that section has the same, you can have a background for that, you can have, you can move the entire section up and down, and so we have all these little strips, all these little sections, and within a section, we have rows and we have columns, right? So uh, within right here, we can see we have one column is what this one is, and, and then down here we have an intersection with three columns in there, and they have uh, elements within that as well. So we've got an image, a little uh, text thing, and then a little more, basically a button down there as well. And so if you go down here, you can see that we have you know quite a few different uh, sections on here, and we can edit each one individually, but let's start off with the very top one. We're gonna start off by clicking on the six dots, and that on the left side will bring us to our editor for this section. We can change the background and, and really everything you could imagine about this, but let's start off with the photo in the background. In order to change this one, we'll go over to style. You see we have an image right there. Delete the image first of all, and you'll see that just brings us to some color. And we'll talk about what that color is doing in a second. That's actually a background overlay. But if we go and click on add a new image, I'm gonna upload some files right now. And in fact, while we're at it, we might as well upload all of all the images we have that are related to this blog. You should have 
maybe five or 10 images that uh, you can use throughout your blog, images that you took or images that uh, you were allowed to use for some reason. This is a demonstrative website, so I'm not actually publishing it, but we're gonna go and select some files here. Now for the top, let's go with the, I don't know, maybe this photo, for example, insert the media, and now we have a background for the top. Uh, and there is that background overlay. So if we click on background overlay, right now it's just green and we can change that to uh, maybe a lighter green would be a little better or we can just change the opacity of that as well. So darker or a little bit lighter. Having some tint to that kind of makes the text a little bit more readable. So I'll leave it probably right around there. Now that's the first background. We can change the text here by double clicking on that, highlight that and let's just call this Santorell Central Urban Gardening. Uh, and if we click on the little pencil icon, that'll allow us to edit this little element being the text. This is actually a heading right here. And so we can change uh, essentially how it's lined up. So if we want it to be centered, if we want it to be left justified, we can go to the style and change some more advanced things about this, like how much space we have all the way around there, how wide, how wide it's allowed to be, and things like that. I'm gonna leave it actually exactly as it is. I think that looks pretty decent. And then down here, we can have a little subtitle. So if we click on this, we can say, um, actually, I don't even think we need that. Let's just click on that and get rid of that all together. So we just right click on this one and go to delete that section. Now we have a button down there. Now the button, this is pretty self-explanatory. You click on it, it'll take you to whatever link you want. And so on the left side, you can see, we currently don't have a link. But but we do have a symbol there, uh, which is essentially going to allow you to use what's called an anchor. Now, we can link this right now to any other page we want. So if I want to, this to link to, let's say, uh, our YouTube page, um, we'll go to youtube.com slash Media. So now it's gonna link to Santrell Media's YouTube channel. The text we can say, um, watch our videos. Maybe that'd be what you wanna do if you're trying to drive traffic from your blog over to a YouTube channel. But one thing to keep in mind when you're making this website that you wanna make sure you have a congruent across all the different pages goal for your website. Are you trying to drive traffic to a high converting page? Probably, right? Are you trying to drive up social media? Are you trying to uh, grow an email list? What are you trying to do? And so if your goal, for example, is to have a cornerstone page that is maybe top five uh, different seed companies or top five, like, you know, planting tools that you might need for gardening, then you want to drive a lot of traffic to that page and have a really high converting page. So with this one right here, uh, I'm just going to leave, this is a home page. It doesn't really matter quite as much. Being that it is a blog, you're more likely going to want to have some relevant articles popping up up here and there are some really great things we can show you on how to do that but for now let's just say watch our videos sure maybe that's what we're going to do and we can close out of this here and continue going down to build out the rest of this page so down here and again this is going to look pretty familiar where you can simply click on what you want uh, and we can see on the left side we can change the image let's change the image to maybe some tomatoes right here we can say that this is going to be let's just say read more about our our, our best tomatoes so if we go to the nine dots on the top right there, we can go and click and drag a heading. Now let's add a heading up here and let's just say read. And then we can click on this and say, maybe this is read more. And then over here, maybe we have a different article. And this one, let's just go and change the media for this one to uh, maybe some lettuce, right? So we can say urban gardening tools. And this could be, um, these are our essential there we go. So maybe that's another article right there. This one doesn't have a button, so we can simply duplicate this. If we like this button, we can right click on that. We can duplicate that button. And again, click and drag it over to say right here. We can have right there. We can say read more. And again, any one of these you can customize. So let's dig a little deeper into customizing the buttons, for example. If we click on the buttons, we have three tabs. We have content, style, and advanced. I show you a little bit about what each of them does already, but kind of summarizing what each one is. Content is going to be what's actually visible to, or what, like what's written there, essentially how the text is laid out. Uh, style is going to be more about the colors and the shape of everything. And then advanced is going to be the spacing, how it interacts with other things. If it's showing up for mobile, for desktop, for tablets, or all three. And so starting off with the button on content, we already changed the text. We didn't add a link to this one, um, but I showed you guys how you could add a link. Just type whatever link you want in. But let's actually add, um, I mean, for the sake of example, let's add an anchor here so I can show you how an anchor works. We'll do that in just a second. Let's say that this is going to be center aligned. 
Actually, it was better left aligned. Uh, the icon, we don't have an icon right now, but you could add one if you wanted. Um, and of course, the button ID is not something I'm adding right now. But if we go over to style, this is where we can choose the color of the button. When people hover, is anything going to be different about the button? A lot of times you can invert like a white and green or just switch whenever you hover over that. Um, right here, it's going to darker green. That also works very well. We can add a radius on there. So a border radius, maybe we want like a five or 10 pixel radius on there. So 10 pixels. There we go, a nice little radius on the button instead of being so square. But given that the theme of this is very boxy and very square, I would probably rather have no uh, nothing change with that. But something to note is the little chain icon here will actually link all the values together. So if you click that and get rid of that, you can only have a radius, say, on the top right. So if you want to have like 30 pixel radius on the top right, you have a little bit of a rounded edge there, a little slope. So that's a, a way to be a little bit more creative if you're trying to do that. And obviously not necessarily with buttons, but with pictures, that's a really common thing people like to do. And of course, if you click on the photo up here, you will have the same tools. You can add a radius to, say, one corner. So if that's your style, definitely go ahead and do that. Let's click on the pencil again, continue on with this. The padding, like I said, everything around there, um, I don't, I'm not going to add any padding to this because I think it's pretty well spaced as it is. But if you wanted to add some padding, we could add a lot around there to change the size of the button. So I'm going to undo that uh, simply by clicking history. We can go down there and click right here. That's where we were last. And we can say update. That'll make sure we're saving everything and keeping it where we were. Now, the history button I just showed you on the bottom, uh, hopefully you guys can see that on this. Yeah, you can see that. So that right there is a super powerful tool. So if you ever mess anything up, you just go back to, you know, undo as many steps as you need to all the way back to the beginning of the session uh, when you logged on. So let's click the little history button to get rid of that again. Let's actually go back to uh, actually... So let's click on the pencil icon to go back to where we were. And we can go over to advanced. Here's more margin and padding. So again, padding's kind of redundant here and here. Uh, but margin is what you're seeing on the top. We have 20 pixels of margin above it and nothing below that. Uh, if I wanted to put anything below there, I'd probably want more space. So on the bottom, I'm going to make sure that's also 20 as well. Other than that, we can change, uh, you know, some real advanced things on here you probably don't need to worry about right now. But what you probably will want to know about is the responsive section. So if you ever view this, let's show me, let me show you how to do this real quick. If you click on the responsive mode, you can view this on the top as a mobile site. So in mobile, if you decide, you know what, that's just like too many articles being recommended right there. Let's instead get rid of this entire column right here, or maybe just get rid of the picture, get rid of whatever you want to do. Let's say we want to get rid of the column. We can click on this little column. Uh, that's going to bring us into the settings. Again, go over to advanced, go to responsive. And from there, we can say, let's hide this on mobile. When you're on mobile, you don't need to see that entire column. This entire section is now grayed out. Obviously, when they visit, it's not going to be grayed out. It's just going to be missing altogether. Um, but it's showing you because when you switch between uh, to desktop, then it won't be. It's actually going to be existing there. So that's a really powerful tool. If anything doesn't look right on, on tablet or on mobile, it's very easy to just hide it there uh, and show something else there instead. So that's essentially how you'd go about editing some of the fundamentals on a page. Let's go down and see what else we have. I want to get you guys a little bit more familiarized with how Elementor works, which by the way, as you start to get more advanced with this, I do have a full tutorial digging through all the little nitty gritty details of how to use Elementor, how to use every single one of these. I recommend checking that out in the future, but hopefully for now, today, this should be everything you need to know to build your website and get off the ground. Let's talk a little bit more about adding a new section. You know, I said I was going to go down and start talking about these. This is kind of what I just showed you how to change. Um, so it's not going to be a whole lot interesting there. Um, I will change those images, but let's say we want to add a new section. We can click on the plus icon between the two sections where we want to insert it. So if I click on plus, we can add a new one and you can either add one from a template. We don't have any templates yet. We can add one from a starter template. So that's going to use uh, the starter plugin that we got from Astra before. And if I just, I'll show you for demonstrative purposes, we can go to blocks. And we have a lot of different options here. You can go and see all types of blocks from contact us to forms uh, to, you know, doing all types of things like that. And a lot of, you know, common layouts are going to be found here and it can save you a lot of effort and a lot of time. So let's just say maybe this one looks really good for us. We can just view it first of all and say, you know what, I really like that. We can import the block and that's going to be used right here. Now, I'm not going to do that right now because I want to show you some of the tools we have available to build it from scratch. So on the left side, like I said, if you click on those nine dots, you'll get all the different elements you can add. 
and we have them in different little categories. So we've got the favorite ones. We don't have any favorites saved yet. We've got the basic ones, which you will be seeing right now. Everyone has access to those. If we go down to Pro, upgrading to Elementor Pro, if you go to santrellmedia.com slash Elementor, you can upgrade to Elementor Pro. It's a really powerful tool. You're able to do a lot more with that uh, to customize your website even more. But like I said, the free version already does a pretty decent job. Should definitely be getting you started. So from here, you can see we can add a like a heading, for example. So if we want to call this section, let's just say our, our top articles. I don't know, maybe something like that. That's probably not what I would actually add there. But let's just, you know, for the sake of example, let's do that. And then we want to add, you know, three little things below that, maybe four columns below that. Click on the nine dots. And we want to add an intersection here. So a section within a section. Click on that. And if we click on the little six dots, we can change how this is actually laid out. So if we click on structure down there, we can see well, right now it's 30, it's 50-50. That makes sense. You can actually also click and drag this back and forth. 50-50 is probably like the most, the easiest way that I would go about doing this. But let's say we want to add even more columns than that. We want more than just two sections there. Let's go about doing that. So there are several ways you could do this. The easiest way for me is to actually just right click on the little column icon and just duplicate the column. So you have three, let's duplicate it again and have four columns there. That's gonna be good. That's a good way to add four different of our top favorite articles. So going back to the nine dots on the top, we can go and add a little subheading down here. So click and drag a heading. Actually, the best way to do this would be to make one and then duplicate that four times and then change them. It'll save you work. So we can actually do that instead. But this should not be an H1 heading. It, there's different, or H2 right now, there's different levels of headings. Um, and that's going to really interact with your, your search engine optimization, your SEO. So I don't want this to be H2. I'd rather this be like H3, maybe even H4. Uh, but it's just a subheading underneath your H2, which is underneath your overall heading, which is an H1. So the number is just kind of the tiers down in the hierarchy uh, so for how important it is, but also how large it is on the screen. So from there, we can go back and add maybe a text editor under there. We can add a button under there and we can add maybe something else. So you get the idea of how we're going to click and drag and edit things over there. But the other things we do have, like I said, as you start to get other plugins, we have more functionality. So WordPress forms, WP forms is a plugin that came with this theme. Uh, and if you get other ones out there, you can get different elements that can be clicked and dragged in very easily. And so if we want to add like a form down here, we can very easily add, you know, we're gonna have to set this up, but I'm not gonna do that right now. You can set up a form and collect, you know, emails or names or phone numbers or whatever it might be. And that's a great way to build, for example, an email marketing list for a campaign that can recover even more uh, affiliate marketing revenue for you. So if you scroll down beyond the pro section, you get to general and there are quite a few uh, elements you can add here as well. So if we want like a progress bar, we can go and add that one, maybe like right here, for example. And you can have multiple progress bars that could be for, say, a personal resume or something like that. If you find a place to add that into your blog, it's kind of a fun little thing you could add, a fun little element that, you know, shows some animation on your, on your screen or on your website that makes it a little bit more exciting. Other than that, you can read through this on your own time and figure out what each of these are. Like I said, I have a full tutorial on how to use them. So that's all I, you know, I don't want to waste too much of your time on this right here. This is just your homepage. This is your landing page here. Let's talk a little bit more about actually making a blog post in general. And in order to do that, we have to go back to WordPress. So we're going to exit this right here. So if we go back to WordPress, uh, you can just exit to dashboard or you can click on the WordPress icon, do whatever, get back to here essentially. And so from here, like I said, we already talked about pages. We have one page there. You can edit other pages by just clicking edit with Elementor. And before we go into editing posts, I want to really quickly mention what it what happens if you click on the regular edit button. It's not actually a bad thing. You have to do this. It's important. If you click on the regular edit button, this will show you essentially nothing about your page. So if you end up here by accident, edit with Elementor will give you where we were. But the column on the right side is actually very important. So this is going to show you the visibility of your page. If any pages are private, maybe if you're building a new page and you didn't want to put it out yet, you can make it a private page. Uh, the template, of course, is going to show you, be shown down here. Monster Insights, uh, you could exclude this from tracking if you wanted to. I don't really think that makes sense for this page. Uh, the permalink is going to be essentially nothing because this is our home page. But other pages would be santrellurbangardening.com slash about would be the about us page. The featured image is something that we didn't actually set yet. So if somebody's Googling this on, on mobile or sharing the link somewhere, we do want to have a featured image. So we can say that maybe, uh, let's just say this one right here would be 
good for our brand, maybe, for example. So that could be our image there. As far as discussion goes, we could allow or not allow comments on the homepage. I'm not allowing comments. And then page attributes, I'm not changing anything there. But eventually, we will have quite a few more tools here when we actually go and enable a new plugin called Yoast SEO. Uh, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, so I'm gonna click on update. And I, I did say that the first thing we wanna do is start making some blog posts. So blogging is obviously going to be your bread and butter. While you can have good cornerstone pages, your home page, an about page, maybe like uh, something that you keep updated about your top picks or whatever, that could maybe be a page. But your blog posts in themselves are going to be what you create a large library of. And these are going to be probably your primary source of traffic where most people are Googling something, maybe like how to grow tomatoes on a deck, right? And then you would have a blog article about that. Hopefully you rank high in Google and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. And then they'll go and you know read through that article. And then within that article, the goal is to essentially have affiliate links in there that can drive you know, traffic over to a product, they buy the product and you get a commission from that. So if you're not familiar with affiliate marketing, essentially that's the way it works. You are marketing basically for a company, basically for free as well, until somebody goes and buys the product and then you get a commission from that. Uh, it's, it's really the way most of the internet works. That's why so many blogs are free. Uh, and so people can get, just go and, and click on the link order their product at no extra cost to them. The, the, the actual creator, the author will get paid then. And it's a very lively ecosystem on the internet with that happening absolutely everywhere. So continuing on here, if we go to posts, you'll see that we can go to add new. We deleted the hello world post before and now the new one, let's add a title. So what was the title I said a minute ago? I think I said how to grow tomatoes on a deck. Now, of course, your wording on this and everything, you will want to really optimize that, figure out what articles are doing well, what wording is being searched for, what wording has not really been targeted in the past, and what do people want to actually find. So the closer you are to the exact search that somebody's typing in, the more likely you are to rank above competition. So for this right here, you could continue just making your entire blog post right here. I don't recommend that at all. We do have Elementor. So we do have some template kits as well, but like I said, let's go to edit with Elementor and start off from there. They're giving us a, a really a blank slate here and we can eventually make some templates so that it's easier every time you write a blog article, there's already the same header, the same template, and it's easier to work like that. But the first time around, you're gonna have to build some from scratch essentially. So. Looking at this, we can go and add elements just like we did with the actual home page, the, the original page I was editing, but we do also have some other things as well. Because this is an article, we can add things like, for example, if I type in author, you'll see we have an author box, we can add that. If we go down to site, you can see that we have quite a few pro ones here as well. So you can have like an author box, maybe for example, uh, you can have a featured image, you can have uh, archive title, page title, you can have some more interactive things. So if you change like the title of the blog, it'll change here as well. I mean, it's already gonna do that up there, but you know, you can customize it a little bit more. So, so let's just say for this one, we want to start off with uh, maybe a large image up here. So we could go, again, if you upgrade to Elementor Pro, you're gonna have a lot more out of this, but we're gonna go and add an image up top. And then down here, we can add some text uh, just to get a general layout. We can have an intersection down here. Uh, so let's add an intersection then, and we can add some text on the left side and then we can have some text on the, on. we can add an image on the right side, image on the right side. Actually, I really don't like this gigantic image up here. Um, let's get rid of that one. Let's delete that. And so we can have some text here. Let's get some dummy text to really fill this out. There we go. And then below that, we can have some more text, but maybe this is going to be a full width text if you just hover right down here. So you see the wide blue bar, let go. There's some full text. Uh, we can add some more down there. And so obviously formatting is going to be, you know, depending on the style of your site, you get the idea of how we can go about doing this. But the most important thing when you're working with an affiliate website or affiliate blog is you want your affiliate links to be in here. They have to be clickable, right? And so what a lot of people do is you'll highlight the text. So if we just go to this right here, we can highlight some text or we can highlight text over here rather. So we'll click and highlight, say this text right here, click on the link. And this can be where you paste your affiliate link. Now, there are many places to get affiliate links. One of the easiest or one of the most common ones to get started with is actually Amazon Affiliates. So if we open a new tab and go to Amazon Affiliates, 
Amazon affiliates, you'll see that the Amazon, or sorry, Amazon Associates is what they call it. Amazon Associates is the affiliate program with Amazon, so their affiliate marketing. You can essentially find any product on Amazon, get a link for that, and then you'll get between, I think, one and 3% commission for that, which, like I said, when you're getting started off, you're gonna have smaller commissions, but eventually, you can find other things that have higher commissions, you can work directly with manufacturers, you can even have sponsors commi uh, commissioning as well, that will pay you a set amount of money to have a link in your, you know, their own link in your article for a certain amount of time. In addition to having uh, affiliate links in here, a lot of people link out to other articles on their website or other articles on other websites as well. Uh, these are called backlinks when somebody else makes a link and links it to you. It's one of the ways you can rank higher on Google when you start to essentially gain credibility. So let's say for example, maybe some you know big news outlet, say CNN for example, wants to make an article about things you can grow on your back deck and they view you as an expert. Maybe they'll email you and say, hey, we really want a quote from you uh, on our article here and so you can give them a quote. They can give you a link, they'll, they'll link to you usually and that'll come back to here and that way Google, they don't wanna show bad, uh, essentially bad sites to people. They don't wanna show bad pages to people. So without getting too deep into how Google works, there are many different tools. For example, Moz does a great job of explaining this every year uh, with different outlines and best practices. But one of the things Google does is essentially they don't always trust new websites, right? Because anyone can make a malicious website, they can make 20 a day, go out and attack people, and if that's showing up high on Google, people are gonna click on those and say, you know what, Google's not good, and they're not gonna like Google, and they're gonna stop using Google, Google makes less money. So Google wants people to rely on them. They wanna be a good, reliable search engine so that they can show more ads, they can make more money. Ultimately, the user gets a better experience, they get more money, and the way they do this is by having a system that slowly builds up trust with different websites. So when you're a new website, they don't trust you right away. They don't know enough about you. They do trust CNN to be a legitimate website that is not going to be scamming you out of your money or hacking you or, or you know, giving you malware. So that's why CNN will rank high when you search for CNN. But if you search for my website, it's unlikely to rank high right now until you get that backlink. When a website with a high, what's called domain authority, links out to you, then that'll boost you a little bit. You know, because it's essentially a token of credibility where Google says, oh, this website that we view as very credible is saying that you're uh, credible as well. You know, that's boost you a little bit and you get enough of those and eventually Google will view you as a credible website. And of course, this will help you rank higher in Google. That's the moral of that story there. Now, with this, I think you guys get the idea of how you can go about building an article so we can go and publish that when we're ready or we can save it as a draft. Uh, this one is obviously super uh, not done at all right now, so I'm just gonna save it as a draft, but you get the idea. It's all the same tools that you have available and you can build out your entire uh, article like that. So let's click on the uh, top left. We can go to exit right here, and that'll bring us back to our WordPress dashboard. Click on the WordPress icon, and there we go. So now we have an article. Now we have uh, our home page as well as a couple other pages, and on your own time, you will wanna go back and change the other pages, the contact, the amenities, the rooms, whatever other comes with your, with your template. So continuing down the left side, we've got our posts, we've got our pages. I talked about media. That's not really anything that exciting. That's just like the images that you upload. If you upload all of them right here, files, images, videos, whatever, it's easier when you build your website, you can just pull from your media. If this tab didn't exist, I don't think it'd really be that different of a workspace to be honest, but you know, it's kind of convenient to have everything in one place. Comments, uh, as you write more articles, if you have comments enabled with them, which most people do, then you will be able to interact with comments here. You'll be able to filter out the spam comments. And I would recommend getting a plugin, uh, like one of the ones we actually removed, but there are so many other ones out there that can filter the spam comments for you. And it just makes it a lot easier because there are so many spam comments out, uh, spam commenting bots out there. Elementor settings, we don't need to worry about that. Templates, like I said, this is something a little bit more advanced. I'm not gonna cover it in this video, but eventually you can make a template for a blog article. And I know I'm gonna cover this very briefly right now. I, I know I said I wouldn't, but just really quickly, if we go to add new, you can make a new template. And so this could be a new page, it could be a new section, it could be a new landing page. And then if we go down to plugins, there are quite a few plugins that are super, super beneficial. Most of them are free or freemium really, where they're free to use but you can upgrade to, uh, much like Elementor, you can upgrade and get more functionality out of them. So the first one I wanna recommend is actually called Yoast, which is Yoast SEO. We'll search for Yoast, Yoast, uh, just like toast but with a Y. 
there it is with 5 million active installations, super popular. It's a great tool that can kind of audit what you're doing and give you the resources you need to rank higher in Google by correctly populating your metadata. And what I mean by that is we'll activate this and you'll see, we'll go up to uh, our, our post right there, our blog article, and it'll show us what we're missing, if it's readable, what needs to be improved. Maybe we have long run on sentences that just make it less readable. Maybe our images don't have alt text. So Google, it's harder for Google to identify what our article is about. Maybe we don't have any keywords consistent or maybe we have too many keywords and that's a red flag for Google. And so all this kind of backend stuff that a lot of people would typically hire an SEO expert for and would charge thousands of dollars, you can kind of get most of it done on your own just using something like Yoast SEO. And like I said, if you read through the Moz annual report of what Google cares about, this can really help you a lot. So going back up, like I said, if you go to posts, you can see Yoast will give you a lot of tools. So if we go to regular edit, not edit with Elementor, we scroll down, you can see Yoast shows up down here. And we could say if this one is how to grow deck tomatoes uh, or tomatoes on a deck, maybe this could be deck tomatoes, deck tomatoes, hit enter. And it's gonna tell us First of all, what it looks like in, uh, in Google when somebody searches for this, but also it's gonna tell us like how well we're doing with this, the readability, fine, whatever, but it's gonna give us suggestions down here and say, you know what, you don't use your key phrase like anywhere. Obviously it was all Latin dummy text, so that's true. Also, we don't have outbound links, we don't have internal links, we don't have a key phrase in the title, introduction, we don't have all this different stuff. And so it's gonna make it a really useful tool for you to figure out, make sure you're doing everything right, all the best practices, to rank in Google. And most importantly, it also gives you the ability to change the URL slug. So your URL, you know, centralurbangardening.com slash what? And so right now it's just the entire title, but we could just call this one deck tomato guide. Deck tomato guide, maybe that's what we want. Um, and so that way we have deck tomatoes, deck tomatoes guide, maybe something like that. That way we have our key phrase in the slug. Maybe that's helpful for some people at least to remember what this is. And we can change things like our meta description. Instead of just pulling a random set of words from our article, maybe we can have something in here that says this is a guide to growing the absolute, there we go. So that's gonna show up in Google instead of having some random text from your article. And of course it shows us that we don't have an image there. We can go to desktop results and see what that looks like as well. So Yoast SEO, a super, super powerful tool. I'm just gonna publish this article anyway. It's definitely never gonna be found but we'll go and, and publish that nonetheless. Let's go back to where we were in the WordPress dashboard. Okay, so now that we have our website, I showed you how to make blog posts, how to do pretty much everything that we need to know so far. The next is going to be making uh, the articles that actually are going to drive a lot of traffic and optimizing for that as well. So of course, the tools that I showed you like Yoast SEO and uh, SEMrush and other ones, or SEMrush, I think they pronounce it SEMrush actually, um, those are all gonna be great tools, but there's really three types of content that you want to be making and several different ways that you can go about finding good content to make. So the best way to understand the three types of content is to first start with why people search in the first place. This should always be the first thing you think about is what is the intent of the searcher or the, the user that is typing this into Google or Bing or whatever search engine they use. And so sometimes people search something and they just want a quick answer. So they just type in a quick little question and that's going to be where you want a response post. These posts should be about a thousand to maybe up to 1500 words. They're shorter posts, they really get to the point and they're answering a more fundamental question, right? Like how long do you cook a Thanksgiving turkey? Something like that. That, people don't want to know the theory behind turkeys and how to raise turkeys and everything else. They just want to know 350 degrees, 15 minutes per pound, something like that. That's what people want to know. The second type of post is just basically a regular blog post. This would be about 2,500 words. And this could be something as simple as like, what is the best type of dirt to use or soil to use in your garden? So if you're a, an urban gardener, that would be something that people would want to search for. It's not a quick question. They want to know a little bit more about it, but you don't have to go way down in the details with this one. Um, and so this again, 2,500 words is probably the optimal length for that. And then thirdly, the most important one on your entire website, this is going to be your cornerstone content. Now you want several cornerstone pieces, of course, but these are going to be your fundamental pieces that have the most detail. A lot of your articles are linking back to here. Think about it, it is the cornerstone of your website, uh, the pillar, the, the foundation. 
this is going to be incredibly important. So this could be, for example, a grower's guide, or this could be a full guide for urban gardening or something. And this could be a really long post. This could be 3,500 to even 4,000 words, uh, maybe even longer than that as well. And you wanna have a lot of details in here. This should be linked to a lot from other blog posts that you have, and this should be really what your website is known for. So those are kind of the three different styles, but you can think about them in other ways as well. So like Hero Help Hub is a really common concept for content creation as well, whether it's uh, Instagram or video or a blog post in this situation. You can Google that on your own time, but those are some different ways to think about how to make different blog posts. Now, when you're actually searching for the right topic to, to make, Keep in mind, you have those three, but then you wanna look for what is working for other similar blogs. What are so That'll give you an idea of what people are searching for, and you can go into Google and kinda of just work backwards through Google. So starting one thing at a time, if you look at Google and you type in one of your main keywords, Google fills in things for you and tells you what people are searching. So you could either use Google Trends to look at you know, one phrase versus another, or you can go to Google and type in half of your phrase. You can put an asterisk before your phrase, and Google will give you a lot of suggestions for what people are actually searching for because it's based on what it thinks you're going to search for. But one thing to keep in mind, make sure you're always doing this in a new incognito or private browser so you don't have any cookies where Google is kind of predicting what you are doing. You wanna know what other people are doing, so a fresh browser tab is always a big benefit here. Now, on top of that, you wanna kinda of keep in mind that Google gives you other things, like they give you suggested questions. So if I just look up urban gardening, you'll see that down here we have quite a few different questions. It says people also ask, and in that category, you can start clicking on them, and as you click them, several more pop up. So this is a great way to see what questions are being asked. You can also go and start digging through these and looking at, the, with each question, what is the quality of the response? Is it actually answering the question that you had? And is this something that you can compete with? So if there's a really strong domain authority, it's unlikely you'll be able to compete with it right away. If it's outdated, if it's a small website, if they didn't answer the question right, or if uh, maybe if it's even just like a Reddit post or Quora, those are all great examples of where you could possibly get that, and that's a search that people are already making that you could easily swoop in and start ranking for. Now, so that's essentially the Google side of it, and there's you can make an entire video talking just about SEO, just about choosing the right blog article, but the flip side of this is looking at what keywords are working for your competitors, and this is where Ahrefs and SEMrush really work. You can dig in here, look at what keywords people are ranking for, what articles are driving the most traffic, and once you find similar, obviously don't copy each other, like you have to make your own stuff, but it can give you a good idea of what's working for other people, and maybe this is something that you didn't even think of in the past, and it should be something that you could consider making content related to that. And so I wanna talk a little bit more now about the different outlets you can go to to get some affiliate links. So like I said, Amazon Associates is a super popular one. That's one of the big ones that people get started with. Another one people use is called Planet Howl. Uh, this has a lot of different brands out there. I've worked with them in the past, and so they'll work with like Best Buy, HP, Sephora, Samsung, Target, a lot of these big box stores that you can buy a lot of stuff from, but also, of course, they have their online retail as well. So if it's not something that sells directly from Amazon, or if you want, it's, you know, a lot of these do have a higher commission or they'll have different promos, uh, you can work directly with that. And I'll have a link to that in the description. Actually, we'll have a lot of links in the description, so make sure you go down in the description and I'll have a list of a bunch of different uh, affiliates that you can actually get started with and Howl, Planet Howl is another one. Of course, on top of that, we have Impact Radius or now they're just called Impact, so impact.com. If you go to impact.com, this, uh, we'll have links to this as well. This will have partnerships with more brands that, I mean, like I said, they do have products on here, but Impact is, in my mind, it's more for like software-y kind of stuff, right? But you can work with Adidas or Airbnb, like that's the kind of thing I was thinking about, like Airbnb type stuff or Uber, things like that, McAfee, those type of things are what I would expect to find on Impact, uh, whereas Planet Howl would be more like product and retail type things. But regardless, Walmart is still on Impact. We've got Ticketmaster. You can see as you know the little thing rolls by, a lot of different options there. So impact.com, super powerful and really a big network as well. They're also very easy to work with. I find that their analytics are in depth 
easy to make sub IDs for different articles uh, because as you, of course, this is very important, as you make more articles and as you find more affiliates, the data that you collect is going to be very important that you keep it organized so you can figure out what articles are converting well because if everything is going to the same exact affiliate link, you know how many link clicks that's getting, but you don't know from which article it's really coming from. And there are tools to find that out, but it's just easier if you have sub IDs for the affiliate links. And once you set up impact, it's really pretty obvious what that means. Uh, but essentially, each link, you can have a sub ID that categorizes it internally within impact that maybe this is for that article, and then the same link for a different article, the same link for another article. So it's just way easier to track. And really the fourth one I wanted to mention is CJ. Uh, so CJ is right here. Uh, they used to be called CJ Affiliate, but now they're just called CJ, kind of simplifying their name. And this is a lot like impact, honestly. So if you're looking to promote, uh, you know, some like TurboTax type things, as you can see right there, uh, or hotels, for example, they do have a lot on here as well. So between these four, there's really a pretty limitless library of different products and services you can promote on your affiliate website, uh, on your affiliate marketing blog. So, so obviously there are so many different affiliate networks out there, depending on the niche you're getting into, those are all great tools to get started with, but you know, tons of other ones as well. Those are just ones that a lot of people do end up working with. In addition to that, I wanna talk about some of the tools you can use to really automate and boost your own website here. The first one, uh, there's actually quite a few from Google, so I wanna start off with the Google-based ones. They're free, and obviously, one of the big goals uh, of, of a blog is to rank on Google. That's really where you're probably going to be getting a lot of your traffic, unless you're something that gets shared by email or on Facebook or something like that. But I think for most people, a blog, like a blog is really going to be found on Google, or at least that's the primary goal, one of the most passive ways if you have good content. So to rank higher on Google, we really wanna start off with Google Search Console and then Google Analytics. Those two combined give you so much insight into how you're already ranking on Google, where your traffic's coming from, and then what people are doing within your website. Are they reading article after article? Are they getting through one article and they end up clicking on a link and going to a 404 page? Like you, it tells you kind of what people are doing on your website, which is super, super informative. So in order to do this, we do already have Monster Insights right there, which makes it so easy to set up Google Analytics. So let's go to Launch Setup Wizard, and that's gonna ask us some really basic questions and make it so easy. So we are uh, a publisher, we're making a blog, we're gonna save and continue. Down here, uh, we could get a license key. We don't need a license though. So if we want to upgrade to pro, we can. I'm just going to say connect. Now I already track a bunch of other blogs, so I'm not gonna mess up that analytics by signing into Google here. So instead I'll just show you, I'm gonna cut right here, I'm gonna show you um, another. So when you actually get it all set up and you sign into Google Analytics, this is what it would look like. This is an older blog from a pretty long time ago when we started it. Uh, you start off and when you connect it, if you have any traffic in the beginning, uh, it'll show you how many page visits you get per day. And you can see over time it's starting to grow and you can really dig into an audience overview down here, as well as the traffic, uh, the source, the referrals, where things are coming from. And it's a great way to figure out like what's actually working on your, on your website, where the traffic is, so in what country, um, what device they're using. You can really find a lot of in-depth analytics here, which is why it's called Google Analytics. And again, this is an entire tutorial for another day to dig deep, deep into this and figure out how you can optimize based on that. But that's one of the first tools I wanna to talk about. The next one, like I said, is Google Search Console. So going back to where we were. So from Google, we can just look up Google Search Console, Google Search Console, and that'll take us to search.google.com slash search dash console slash about. And we can just click on start now. And once again, I'm not gonna sign into Google. I'm gonna cut over to another account that I already have. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to set this up. You have to you know, do some stuff with your DNS and stuff like that, but it does give you instructions. Google's really good about telling you exactly what you need to do step-by-step -step to actually get that set up. Uh, so I'm gonna go and show you now what it looks like on the inside for another search console that I have set up with another blog. So here's again an example from back in 2020, uh, a blog that we started in the beginning. Uh, it starts off with like almost no traffic. Over time, it will pick up. And you will notice like, you might say, oh, that's not impressive at all. Well, this, I mean, the world of blogs and Google is just very, very different. It's a lot more of a mature industry right now. So it's not at all like what you'd expect with some social media where things just suddenly hockey stick become viral. 
and come crashing down and go back up. A lot of times with blogs, it's all about the long game. It's going slow and, and gradually building up your library, getting more backlinks, building up a website that over time can get more and more traffic, can rank in Google, and consistently earn you more money with affiliate link, getting more traffic on there. And so one of the most common things we see, as I mean, Nate's mentioned it in previous videos as well, we see a lot of people that will start a, a blog, starting kind of website, and they'll go at it for maybe one or two months, maybe three months, and they'll see no progress. They'll get frustrated and they'll still have, you know, maybe like a couple, maybe a hundred or a couple hundred visits, and then they'll just give up. And then maybe a couple years later, they'll say, you know what, I really thought I had a blog. And they'll go and sign on and they'll see that it absolutely grew substantially larger than it is, and they'll wish that they kept pushing and making blogs. So with blog articles, it is a long game. If you find the right niche that is, you know, is very unsatisfied on Google, like a lot of people are looking it up, and not a lot of people are finding articles that are good, then that's a great opportunity and you wanna make sure that you're pushing for a long time on that and don't expect to see too many results too soon. Like I said, it's not going to be an instantaneous thing, but patience is the biggest virtue in this industry here. Another tool I wanna to show you is one related to what I just mentioned being searches on Google and this is trends.google.com. So trends.google.com. And this is absolutely the most powerful tool out there, in my opinion, whether you are investing or selling e-commerce items or making a blog article, this is, the, this is the key to what the world is looking for. And the world uses Google, or at least a lot of the English speaking world uses Google. Of course, other, some countries use their own things. But Google's such a common one that you can fi figure out what people are really looking for. And so if we think people are looking for deck tomatoes, we can ty type, in, type in deck tomato, we can say that, we could say patio tomato, and you can see side by side which one has more searches. So here you could say patio tomato might be a better article than deck tomato. Maybe people aren't growing tomatoes on a deck, maybe it's more of a patio, maybe it's a porch. Let's look up that one. And you can see that people are growing different things in different areas, and, and it also tells you where people are searching these. So of course, this is common in the Northeast where a lot of people have smaller apartments. I imagine if you live in Nebraska or North Dakota, South Dakota, you're not living in a small apartment where you need to have patio tomatoes, you probably have a larger property. Uh, and so that's gonna be all really important information for you. And so I think that this tool right here, not only can, can, can you do an A to B comparison and figure out what people are searching for, but it also suggests other similar search terms down here. So patio tomato varieties is another one. Maybe people wanna know that. And on top of that, if you actually just go to Google, I recommend doing this in a, an incognito tab so you don't have Google being influenced by your previous searches. But you can also see what, be, what Google recommends as well. So if we say um, tomato, or if we say patio tomato, plants, we could say planter, seeds, varieties, determinant or indeterminate, plants near me. These are all things that people are searching for and so they might be good things for you to actually write articles about. So maybe what is the difference between indeterminate and determinant? Which one's better, better for growing on a patio? What are the best varieties? It's all very useful for finding the best article titles. The next great tool I wanna to talk about is called SEMrush. A lot of people call this SEMrush, but apparently SEMrush calls it SEMrush, so that's what I started calling it. And so if we go to santrellmedia.com slash SEMrush, you can get started on, on SEMrush, and it's really a super powerful tool where you can look at what your competitors or what other blogs are doing, what they're ranking for, whose backlinks they're getting, what kind of articles are doing better than other ones, and you can really get so much insight into so many other websites as well as into your own as well. And as it says right here, you're really getting measurable results from that. So if you are data-driven, which I mean, I am, I think it's a really good habit to be as well, then you'll be able to really dig through this, figure out what's working, and so you're just getting so much vision through uh, an otherwise opaque wall that is the internet, right? So if you can't, you can't just go to a website and figure out what kind of traffic they're getting, but this tool right here does allow you to do that. Also, Ahrefs is another competitor. Um, so if we go to ahrefs.com, you can see that they have really similar stuff. I'll actually log in and show you guys what these tools look like. Um, but a third one, of course, is actually a free one that is from Neil Patel, who is a bit of an SEO expert. If you haven't heard of him, go check out his stuff as well. And so he has uh, one that's called Uber Suggest. 
it's gonna search on Brave here instead of Google, but Uber Suggest is a free keyword tool. This one is a lot more limited, but it is free, a good way to start at the very least. But let's take a look at SEMrush. I have an account with them, and I'm gonna show you how you can actually utilize them. So if we want to write an article, for example, let's go to Google, and let's just say we wanna write an article about uh, growing, growing, um, indeterminate tomatoes. So let's just say we want to grow indeterminate tomatoes. Look up that and you'll see that right here we have the first ranking article is this one. And like I said, it's just a regular blog. You can go down. I bet they have affiliate links in here. Um, they also probably have a little disclaimer up at the top about their affiliate links. Very, very common. And as you go down, you can see best tasting tomatoes. They're linking out to other articles. They're linking out to the heaviest, another article, the heaviest tomato they ever grew. Um, and a lot of stuff like that. But let's just say we want to know more about this. Oh, there it is. They want to get you a free vegetable garden planner. There we go. So that, that's how they're collecting your emails. Very interesting. Well, if we copy the link to this article, so let's copy this, and let's go over to SEMrush. And from here, we can enter domain, a URL, or a keyword. I'm going to start off with this. We're going to say search. And from here, you can see that it's telling us that this domain, homefortheharvest.com, is getting a lot of traffic, and they grew a lot in the past year, but it seems like they had a little bit of a drop since July to August, and actually they're still dropping now. So that's also good insight to see if you're seeing a decline, is that industry-wide, or is that something that is specific to your articles? Maybe you're being outcompeted by one specific thing. So this is also super good to look at, and I recommend looking at, so they have a good, a pretty, you know, pretty decent 50 domain authority score, uh, and it'll tell you what yours is as well as you start to, you know, get more backlinks, get more traffic, make more content out there. It'll tell you, you know, you can see some progress along that track as well. But within here, we can go and look at compared domains, we can look at a growth report, but if you go down here, this is what's so interesting. You can look at what their traffic, what the source of their traffic actually is. We can go to desktop or by mobile. This is very interesting. You can see each one individually. Going back to desktop though, let's go down here and see what their top organic keywords are. This is so important. So you can see that they're getting a lot of traffic, 22,000 clicks uh, by looking up types of apples. So this is actually huge because they're getting a lot of traffic from that. Um, and so you can go and view the details on all of these and see where they're actually getting traffics from. So they're getting plant puns for some reason. People are looking that up and going to them. And if we go to this, you'll see that it links to that article, how, how much traffic they're actually getting on that article. And so it might give you some ideas of what articles are working well for them, what are not working well, what kind of articles you can kind of make to compete with them. And you can kind of figure out, you know, you can work backwards and look at what articles are doing well, what, article, what articles probably have affiliate links. You can go and check that out for yourself by looking at the articles. And then what are the rates on those affiliate links? So if they're selling like really, really cheap things, if it's some kind of, you know, tiny little garden shovel that's like $2, $3, they're probably not getting that much out of it. But if they're selling like big rototillers that are over $1,000 and, and people are buying this for, the, for their garden, and they're getting a lot of traffic to that article, that could really be a cash crop for you. And now the very final tool I wanna to mention in this video, this is to actually find more people to write for you. Uh, Fiverr it tends to be slightly lower quality, more like quick little gigs. Uh, that'd be great if you're trying to make a logo or something like that. Um, Canva.com is a great way to make your own logo. I have a tutorial on that as well. But I w the one that we would probably recommend, besides just going out and finding them on your own, which would be great, uh, is actually going through Upwork. Upwork's a pretty easy way to find some pretty reasonable um, and capable people. You'll see the reviews on there, how well they did, and you can find writers or people skilled at different things. And so it, finding ghost writers like that can be a good way to get started. And like I said, ultimately, if you're able to put out job postings or find people that can write for you through word of mouth or referrals, that's a great way to really build up a, a library that you, you're not always writing all the time. Because ultimately, the goal is to scale your blog as you start making more money, you can hire more people to do more writing so you can spend more time of your own time looking for new articles and things like that. And then the very last thing I wanna recommend is making a content calendar. The most important part about making a blog, now that we've gotten this far, we put in all the effort to make the blog, you have to be consistent. It's so easy to get discouraged and give up on making blog articles and then your website, you know, a lot of times I've seen this time and time again, people make the blog, they make a couple articles, they forget about it, they come back a year or two later and say, wait a minute, I thought I had a blog. They go and they sign on and their articles like ranked really well and then they started to die down over time because 
they didn't keep up with their blog. So it does take a lot of time for Google to recognize you, uh, to start gaining that traction, gain those backlinks, gain that domain authority. And if you keep up with it, if you're consistent, within about three months to six months, you'll probably start seeing some traffic. And if you're doing things right, you should be seeing a lot more traffic around one year and even more than that at two years. So you really wanna keep your head down and working on your blog. So the best way to do this, in my opinion, is to create a content calendar. It's something that you have to be able to keep up with. Don't make it too aggressive, but also make sure that you're keeping up with it. You wanna make sure you're making these articles as you scheduled so that you, you know, keep up with that throughout the year and you really gain the traffic that you think your blog deserves. So that's my rundown on how to make a blog. I really wish you the best of luck out there with your blog. I can't wait to see what kind of blogs you guys make. Leave a comment down below and let me know what your niche is, what kind of blog you're thinking about making. If you enjoyed this video, consider liking and subscribing. I'm Mike O'Brien with Santrell Media. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.